During this strawberry or horror moon, we come together on the land of the Western Abenaki people to worship as the Champlain Valley Unitarian Universalist Society. While studying the special relationship the Abenaki have with this land, we come to realize our responsibility to nurture the young plants around us so that we may enjoy the sweet berries to come. I see trees of green, red roses too, I see them bloom for me and you, and I think to myself, what a wonderful Welcome to CVUUS, the Champlain Valley Unitarian Universalist Society's online Sunday service. My name is Becky Strum. I'm a member of this congregation, and this morning I'll be serving as worship associate for our settled minister, the Reverend Barnaby Feeder, who will reflect in his sermon this morning on something wonderful. For me, the sense of emerging, awakening slowly, carefully, joyfully from this pandemic is something wonderful. On Thursday, I was in person at CVUUS, masked, but joyously mixing the filling for those glorious rhubarb pies at an in-person pie bee. And I look forward to emerging a little more next Sunday at our flower communion where we'll have some outdoor and some indoor in-person opportunities to be together, as well as continuing to have the service available online. So if this is your first time with us, email us at cvuus.org so that we can share more about us with you. The best way these days to stay in touch with all of the many activities going on at CVUUS 
as we begin to find ways to be together is to read the weekly email blast. You'll find many pathways to connection there. That's why if you are new, please let us know so we can send you one. Now, speaking of next Sunday's flower communion, cookie bakers are needed. The service will include a quick, safe, grab and go cookie, juice or soda treat in the fellowship hall. So if you can bake a dozen or more cookies, nut free um, and bring them to the kitchen, let Elizabeth Golden know. Finally, members, please remain after the service for our important annual meeting. And thanks today to our stream team, Margie Young and Richard Hopkins and Abby Sessions for managing the Zoom room and our CVU US board for organizing and conducting the annual meeting. Our call to worship this morning is by Robert French Levins. Holy and beautiful, the custom which brings us together in the presence of the spirit of life. To face our ideals, to remember our loved ones in absence, to give thanks, to make confession, to offer forgiveness, to be enlightened and to be strengthened. Through this quiet hour breathes the worship of ages, the inspiring music of history. Three unseen guests attend, faith, hope, and love. Let us all our hearts prepare them place. Now is the time for our chalice lighting, a symbol of Unitarian Universalism. After the chalice in the video is lit, please join with me in reading the words on the screen. As the kindling of this chalice calls us to community, let there be light. As the flame of this chalice reminds us of our values, let there be light. As the glow of this chalice encourages us to hope, let there be light, let there be light. Let us open our eyes to see what is beautiful. Let us open our minds to seek what is true. Let us open our hearts to love one another. everybody. So this is going to be um, my last time for LA just for a while because we're going to have the flower communion and we're going to have um, choir favorites and then we have summer when I usually don't do time for all ages and and take a break. Um, So before, before I do my story, I just wanted to 
Uh, no, I'll say this after my story. Never mind. I have something to say to you. I always have something to say to you, but I'll start with my story and, and then I'll say it. So here we go. The story that I'm going to share today is a book called When Aiden Became a Brother. When Aiden was born, everyone thought he was a girl. His parents gave him a pretty name, his room looked like a girl's room, and he wore clothes that other girls liked wearing. But as Aiden got bigger, he hated the sound of his name. He felt like his room belonged to someone else, and he always ripped or stained his clothes accidentally on purpose. Everyone thought he was just a different kind of a girl. Some girls had rooms full of science experiments and bug collections. Lots of girls didn't wear dresses. But Aiden didn't feel like any kind of girl. He was really another kind of boy. It was hard to tell his parents what he knew about himself, but it was even harder not to. It took everyone some time to adjust and they learned a lot from other families with transgender kids like him. Aiden explored different ways of being a boy. He tried out lots of names until one stuck. They changed his bedroom into a place where he belonged. He also took much better care of his new clothes. Then one day, mom and dad had something to tell him. I'm gonna have a baby, mom announced. A baby, Aiden said. Does that mean I get to be the big brother? Of course, said dad, ruffling his hair. Aiden thought, that being a big brother was an important job for a boy like him. He wanted to make sure this baby would feel understood right away. The baby needed clothes, so Aiden and his mom went shopping. There were so many choices. Would the baby like seahorses or penguins better? Are you having a boy or a girl? Asked the lady. Aiden didn't like it when people asked if he was a boy or a girl and he hoped the baby couldn't hear yet. He was glad when mom just smiled and said, I'm having a baby. The baby's room needed to be painted. So Aiden and his dad went to the hardware store. Dad chose a gallon of sky blue paint and Aiden added a puffy cloud white. Are you excited for your new brother or sister? Asked the paint guy. I'm excited to be a big brother, Aiden said. The paint guy looked confused. Aiden could tell that he wanted to ask a different question and was glad to have his dad there. The big rollers were fun to paint with. This room feels just like being outside, Aiden exclaimed. He had always felt trapped in his bedroom before they fixed it, but his new sibling wouldn't have to feel that way. You're right, said dad. Let's make some shapes in the clouds. Every baby needs a name. Aiden loved getting to choose his own, but he remembered that it had been hard for his parents to let go of the name they gave him. He looked for names that could fit this new person, no matter who they grew up to be. Babies need someone to read to them, so Aiden practiced and practiced and practiced. Dad wanted to teach Aiden how to change diapers. Uh, maybe later, said Aiden. He decided that picking flowers for his mom was more important. Two weeks before the baby's due date, Aiden started to worry. Maybe he should have picked different clothes. The blue walls might be too bright. He wished he could ask the baby which name they liked best. Mom came to tuck him in. Are you feeling okay, sweetie? She asked. Aiden put his hands over where he thought the baby's ears would be. Do you think the baby will be happy with everything? He whispered. I don't want them to feel like I did when I was little, but what if I get everything wrong? What if I don't know how to be a good big brother? Mom hugged him tight. When you were born, we didn't know you were gonna be our son. We made some mistakes, but you helped us fix them. And you taught us how important it is to love someone for exactly who they are. This baby is so lucky to have you. 
and so are we. The next morning, Aiden found the boxes of his old baby pictures. He looked so different back then. It hadn't been easy, but he liked the boy he was growing into. Maybe everything wouldn't be perfect for this baby. Maybe he would have to fix mistakes he didn't even know he was making, and maybe that was okay. Aiden knew how to love someone, and that was the most important part of being a brother. And there's big balloons that say, it's a baby. And you can see the baby on Aiden's lap in the chair. So I picked this story um, for a few reasons. One is uh, I just wanted to lift up um, transgender kids and families um, that have that are lucky enough to have transgender kids in them and help them um, expand what they thought might be possible for their kids and their family. And the other reason is there's a message in the book um, but I just wanted to say again, at one point they say um, how important it is to love someone for exactly who they are. And to me, that's what this congregation is about. That's why I love this job. That's why I do the work with the kids. Um, that's what I try to bring to this community. And that's what I get from this community. The service today is a lot about, right, that when you show up, there's always going to be something wonderful. You just don't know what it will be, not just because we're together. And, you know, the more people you have, the more, the more surprises and the more things can come up. Um, but also because I really think that this is a group who works very hard to try to love each other for exactly who they are. And I also think, and this is a lot harder maybe, that we try to show up um, as who we are, which is very hard sometimes. And so the other thing I wanted to say is actually a message to the grownups. Um, so kids, you can still listen, but this is a message to the people that have been coming to these worship services really since we first started them, when we first had to quickly pivot and come to Zoom, families were totally overwhelmed <laughs> and many still are. Um, and so showing up in the morning, you know, to try to come see these services live on Zoom has been really tough. So the people that I have seen have been you. I mean, if you look around, you're, you're the group that I have just spent the last however many months, 14 months, and pretty much all of the pandemic with. Um, and you're a group, some of you I knew really well before we went into this. Some of you I didn't know at all. And some of you I knew enough to kind of say, oh, you know, there's so-and-so and wave and say hi. But I never got to stay for whole services like this. Um, I never got to, you know, see each other's faces and feel so intimately connected. And <laughs> mm. I, <laughs> I know that getting to see you this whole time, um, not just see you, but getting to see you and connect with you. And many, many, many of you <laughs> sent me emails and sent me messages in the chat to say thanks for the story or thanks for the song or thanks for whatever. Or the time when my job was so bizarre. I mean, basically my job was totally different and I was very disconnected from the kids that I usually saw. So you have really been my kids <laughs> this time. Um, and be in my community. And I'm aware that after we um, come back in person, you'll still be there, but it's going to be different, right? We're not going to just be on Zoom. Um, we're going to be in person, which will be wonderful and glorious. But I'm aware that this, for me, is a shifting of something 
but I thought I was just totally psyched to have shift. And I've realized that there's a piece that I'm actually really going to miss. And so I wanted to very deeply say thank you. <laughs> a huge, huge thank you to all of you um, for how much you looked at me <laughs> and sang along and told me how much you liked stories uh, because I'm extremely aware that if I had not had you during this time, it would have been much, much harder um, for me to do this. So it has really, really been a gift to me <laughs> to get to come do this work. And I know I get to keep doing it, but I just wanted to especially say thanks to all of you um, whose faces I'm seeing right now and some of you aren't here and might see this later. Thank you for being so open to me and communicating so much, especially. And I hope it will continue and I, and I know it will. So, ah, uh, there you go. <clears throat> you got a true poppy time for all ages because I cried. So <laughs> going out with the poppy bang. So now my friends, let us shift to do our offering, which is the time that we um, take in money to support this great community and to support another organization, right? We always share our plate with another organization and we're now in the month of June. So this month's organization that we're gonna share with is the Festival on the Green in Middlebury, which last year, as many of you know, could not happen. <laughs> After however many years, I grew up with them. I remember being a kid and running around the green in the dark um, and how amazing that was. So they're a total gift to us and they're coming back this summer in August, August 2nd through 6th. And they really need our support to keep going, especially when because they had a year off. So um, I hope you will all share as generously as you can and go in August and support their music. And um, here's a message from them. Good morning. My name is Beth Duquette and I'm a volunteer with Middlebury Festival on the Green. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the festival for some of you who haven't been to it or are new in town and it's a wonderful event. We're in our 42nd year. Last year would have been our 42nd, but of course, because of the pandemic, as with so many things, we had to postpone. And we're looking so forward with joy to being back together with everyone and, and family reunions and picnics and this year, we, you know, it's usually the second week of July, but we wanted to wait till August and we're a little condensed. We're doing August 2nd through the 6th, just one show at 7 p.m. But, uh, you know, just a little bit about why I am part of it and have been for so long is it's, it's a pretty joyful event to be working with music and community and everybody being together uh, for this event and working with everybody you know it takes it takes almost a year for the programming to come together and and just seeing what how happy and it's good for the soul and we're really looking forward to being with you again this year and uh, and if anybody wants to join us and help us bring it to fruition where the more the merrier and it's really a lot of fun but I, I do think that uh, the festival is is a very um, dear event to a lot of people and uh, people there's children are now having children and remember being at festival um, so it, it is like a family reunion so um, yeah we hope to see you and uh, thank you for taking this moment letting me take this moment and uh, thank you for your generosity and whether you come and volunteer or people in the community uh, 
with their donations. It is so appreciated. We're, we're all volunteers and we do it for the love of doing it. So, um, and it's a beautiful summer, spring day in Vermont and um, have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Poppy, for your sharing and to Richard for putting together at the last minute this special introduction to our offering with music from the Festival of the Green 25 years ago. Um, and now it's time for our milestones. Um, this is the time in the service where people share events in their lives or concerns and joys. There's always unspoken joys and concerns too. And I know of many of them through private communications, but when people choose to keep them private, I respect that. We do leave time in our service for people to silently pray and meditate what's on their heart so that they can more fully enter into what remains of our service together. And I invite you now into that silence, praying that it will bring you to your full set of feelings that you come with today.
is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that brings my heart such bliss and takes away the pain of my soul, of my soul, and takes away the pain of my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down beneath my sorrow's ground, friends to me gathered round. Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, friends to me gathered round, oh, my soul. To love and to all friends I will sing, I will sing. To love and to all friends I will sing. To love and to all friends who pain and sorrow mend. With thanks unto the end I will sing, I will sing. With thanks unto the end I will sing. Our ancient reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, saying, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days to be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman whom Satan bound for 18 long years be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. Our modern reading is the covenant of the Northern New England chapter of the UU Ministers Association, and this was adopted in 2009. We covenant to support one another in the work of ministry. We want to be together as our best selves with our best behavior. We want each other's help. Radical honesty to see the truth more clearly. Radical hospitality to open us to one another. We want to be accountable to ourselves and to each other because we want to be able to be vulnerable with each other we will not exploit each other's vulnerabilities and we will be forgiving. We want a lightness of heart and a depth of spirit. We know it's complicated. We know there are differences among us in power, in practice, in belief. We know this covenant requires presence and kindness and mindfulness and courage. 
We come together to share gifts, the depth of our wisdom and experience, the clarity of our vision, the strength of our hope. Thank you so much, Becky, for that wonderful reading of, of both of those readings. Several years ago, I was grumbling to Steve Meyer that it was sometimes difficult to come up with catchy titles for services reflecting what I planned to talk about in a sermon seven weeks before that date, which I had to do for the newsletter. Steve told me he thought I should give up. The title for every week, he said, should be Something Wonderful. This strategy was based on Steve's attitude about Sunday congregational worship. As I recall it, he felt that people shouldn't need any prompting from a catchy title or subject to come. They should come every Sunday with confidence that something wonderful was bound to happen at some point. As we talked, I took Steve's experience to be that even if the sermon failed to grab him or hold on to him, and nobody knew better than I that there are countless ways that that can happen. Even if that happened, something wonderful would generally occur to him in the course of the sermon. He would be enriched by being there that morning. Something would happen that made him glad that he was a member of the congregation. And if it wasn't happening in the sermon, maybe it was when he sang with the choir or during the time for all ages or when we all sang a favorite hymn together. It occurred to me later that maybe he even had in mind the noise of an infant crying in the nursery during our time of prayerful silence. There's life following its own order of service again. It's beckoning us to, to mentally comfort the infant, empathize with any parents who are trying to decide if they need to get up and go to the infant, and be grateful that we have trained employees there to be our first responders to the howls. How wonderful this variation on silent prayer and meditation. I see many feedback loops in the life of a congregation. There are always people in thriving congregations who show up to make sure they have a chance to encounter each other and anyone who appears to be a newcomer. How wonderful is that hospitality? There are those who come well aware they are seeking what I'd call the big stuff experiences that might inspire us to make transformational changes in our lives, or an encounter with someone who really needs our help at a time we're able to give it. How wonderful when they find what they seek. But wonder isn't always so earnest. I can't imagine there are any regular churchgoers among us who have never had that wonderful experience of getting to know someone whose life story is so different from ours that it's absolutely astonishing our lives have intersected at all. There's life saying, you wanted a simple blessing? How about getting to know someone new to you? Of course, every type of congregation and every secular community for that matter has its own sources of wonder. I'm prejudiced, but I see UU congregations as especially geared toward creating something wonderful moments during worship. And as you notice the signs of shared emotions are bubbling up in the room, a healing feeling of belonging gets added to the mix. For many of us, it is the music more than any words that stir such wonderful emotions, or maybe collective silence, or rituals like the flower communion we will celebrate next Sunday. And for those of you who are new to us, the heart of that communion is everybody bringing flowers that go into a giant bouquet representing the diversity of our community and then leaving with a different flower than the one they brought. I wanna say a bit more though about music since our search team began interviewing candidates for our new director of music position this weekend. Many of our hymns combine words and music to convey what I'm trying to say this morning much more powerfully than I could ever speak in plain language from the pulpit alone. For instance, there's the hymn that begins, gather the spirit, harvest the power. Our separate fires will kindle one flame. Witness the mystery this hour. Our trials in this light appear all the same. Gather in peace, gather in thanks, 
Gather in sympathy now and then. Gather in hope, compassion, and strength. Gather to celebrate once again. I know that many of you listening to me recite this familiar lyric are dying to sing it together again in our sanctuary. In my original text, I said this sanctuary because I was planning to preach today from our sanctuary until my laptop gave me sign-in problems. So here I am at home. But I know we're gathering again in the sanctuary in our hearts as soon as we can. We've endured such a long 15 months of pandemic distancing. Don't get me wrong. It's been wonderful for many of us that we've been able to meet as often as we have online and even to share some elements of worship that work better online than in person, as Poppy explained to you so wonderfully in her sharing. And to stick with kids for a minute, some of the raw and wonderful honesty we experienced from our coming of age class in their service last month might have been impossible for them to share from a pulpit facing a full room of us rather than it going out over an online service. But online worship is a different species of wonderful than Steve had in mind when he suggested that every service should be titled something wonderful. And now here we are looking forward to a summer of experimenting with hybrid worship. How are we going to reopen our sanctuary by this fall in ways that dish out the wonderfulness of gathering to both those who are walking through our doors and those who are watching from far away online. And thinking about this, I told myself this annual meeting Sunday today was really made for thinking about Steve's suggestions seriously. What would wonderful worship mean as our weekly title for Sunday gathering in the atmosphere in which we're headed? We are about to take a close look at what we've done over the past year and an even closer look at what we are going to commit to trying to do in the year to come. And we're one week away from Flower Communion, that first service where we'll be back in large numbers in the sanctuary, albeit for short periods of time with lots of safety precautions. The technology experimenting on how we will have hybrid wonderful is just about to begin and will go on throughout the summer. I hope you will join me in promising each other to remember that this is all wonderful. If there was no CVU US, or only a small number of us with a part-time minister and no youth program, as is true for so many congregations, the experiments would not be needed. Our ancient reading makes it clear that our challenge isn't entirely novel. In this story from the biblical gospel of Luke, we encounter a stark conflict in a synagogue about what makes for something wonderful in a time of worship. To the religious authorities, it is worship that follows the prescribed rituals of Jewish law and refrains from everything else on the Sabbath, the day of rest. The leader of the synagogue chides the people for seeking healing from Jesus on that day. To Jesus, healing is a form of releasing people from spiritual bondage, which the Sabbath itself is also about in other ways. Now, the people aren't concerned with the theological details of this debate. They are simply rejoicing at the wonderful spectacle of Jesus's healing power and in the shaming of leaders who defined love too narrowly. Can I confess a little envy here? I know nothing I will ever do is going to have crowds of you rejoicing in the way depicted in this Bible story. I can't heal physical disabilities with a laying on of hands. And that's not part of the something wonderful we can offer. But heartfelt consolation is something we nurture, both in worship and through ministries like our Caring Network. And something wonderful happens, I believe, every time we sing, how can anyone ever tell you you are anything less than beautiful, and then treat you like we mean it. I think that the fact that we rely on each and all of us, not miracles, may be unspectacular, but it is a reason to hope that we can offer something wonderful every Sunday. As I'm wrapping up here, I need to say more about what we mean by wonderful. One website I came across very quickly had 42 different synonyms for wonderful. Instead of promising something wonderful each week, we could spice things up by running through that list from admirable, amazing, and astonishing to swell, too much and unheard of. 
we might want to skip over something groovy as two 1960s and something peachy as a tinge sarcastic. But what's really missing from this list is full disclosure. Some things that fill us with wonder aren't what we'd call wonderful. In fact, they're downright terrifying at times. How could we find ourselves caught up so much in destruction, injustice, ignorance, and selfishness? You have to wonder. I mean it. You really have to wonder. For us to be doing everything we need to do in our time of worship, we have to confront the sources of our pain and sorrow, as well as keeping our eyes open for those experiences that Steve had in mind. There's death and dying to deal with, of course, but much more too. As one UU I knew more than 40 years ago said, every time he got a chance to lead a worship service, all of us are in pain, no matter how much we resent it. Some of the most wonderful moments I've encountered at CVUUS have actually been quite painful. And I think maybe Steve also had these moments in mind. Some of you will remember the time Chuck began playing an African-American spiritual as it was written in the hymnal with a little extra dash of haste and energy. Francois stood up, he started complaining, and then he began to sing. And then he charged to the front of the room yelling, no, 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 you have to sing it like this. And he sang and it was slow and it was loud. It was almost tortured. And he was yelling it out at us, even as a few folks in the front row right in front of him cowered. This was a clear violation of our right relations covenant. It was also a clear demonstration of why that covenant might not be adequate to address tragedies like the impact of systemic racism on our congregation. I believe we needed what Francois laid on us that day and that beggars can't be choosers about exactly how it was delivered. There was shock in the room that day, but we responded with love for everyone involved with open-minded conversation about what had just happened and a certain amount of apology. I call that whole morning something wonderful, even as I realize some of you might not. We want though to experience something wonderful at CVUS every week, including if necessary, wonders inescapably bound up in the parts of our lives that need healing. Because of that, I suggest we might want to pay more attention to our covenants. That is promises of how we will try to be together. Covenants are especially important to Unitarian Universalism because we do not have creedal beliefs. You don't have to believe the same things as each other to be welcome among us. But without common beliefs that are binding us together, it only works with a deep and shared commitment about how we will be together in everything we attempt to do, worship, fellowship, social action, Yes, even governance issues like how we organize and finance our congregation. I included the Northern New England Minister's Covenant in our reading because it is the best example of a covenant I've encountered in my lifetime as a Unitarian Universalist. With a little tinkering, I think it could serve a congregation just as well as a group of ministers. So I'm going to end my sharing today as we move towards our annual meeting with the way that covenant ends. We want a lightness of heart and a depth of spirit. We know it's complicated. We know there are differences among us in power, in practice, in belief. We know this covenant requires presence and kindness and mindfulness and courage. We come together to share gifts, the depth of our wisdom and experience, the clarity of our vision, the strength of our hope. May we always come together to share gifts, whether it's in our sanctuary or online for many years to come. Blessed be and amen.
cry, we live, we die, we dance, we sing our song. We need to feel there's something here to which we can belong. We need to feel the freedom just to have some time alone. But most of all, we need close friends we can call our very own. And we believe in life and in the strength of love. And we have found a need to be together. our thoughts to receive, and we believe that sharing is an answer. A child is born among us, and we feel a special glow. We see time's endless journey as we watch the baby grow. We thrill to hear imagination freely running wild. We dedicate our minds and hearts to the spirit of the child, and we believe in life and in the strength of love and we have found a time to be together and with the grace of age we share the wonder of youth and we believe that growing is an Our lives are full of wonder and our time is very brief. The death of one among us fills all with pain and grief. But as we live so shall we die and when our lives are done, the memories we shed with friends, they will linger on and on. And we believe in life and in the strength of love. And we have found a place to be together. We have the right to grow. We have the within our living is an answer. We seek elusive answers to the questions of this life. We seek to put an end to all the waste of human strife. We search for truth, equality, and blessed peace of mind. And then we come together here to make sense of what we find. And we believe in life and in the strength of love and we have found a joy being together and in our search for peace maybe we'll finally see even to question truly Let us go forth to our annual meeting, a time to plan our joy in being together and to question truly, and then on into the week of fulfilling our lives by living ever more closely 
to our UU values, blessed be.